chaos, anger, and confusion mar the Democratic Republic of Congo's long-awaited presidential election. How digital developments both help and threaten trade by developing nations. And the continent's cultural and arts highlights of 2018. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Voters in the Democratic Republic of Congo cast their ballots on Sunday in a long-delayed presidential election that drew immediate criticism for its lack of organization, allegations of vote rigging and malfunctioning equipment. Both of the presidential frontrunners say they are confident of victory, but critics say this chaotic situation has, was part of the plan all along to keep the ruling coalition firmly in control. Viewers Anita Powell reports from Johannesburg. Chaos and anger in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is what Congolese voters will take away from the day they have waited for for so long. Problems abounded as millions of people voted Sunday in a general election delayed more than two years. Even in the capital, voters couldn't find their names on the rolls, electoral materials arrived late, and the voting machines failed or were too hard for many voters to use. I came to sanction Mr. Kabila. I want to vote for change, but unfortunately, there is no voting. There are no machines. There's nothing. Some people could not even find their names on the list. In three districts considered opposition strongholds, the government canceled the vote for over a million people, blaming security risks and an Ebola outbreak. Nonetheless, opposition presidential candidate Martin Fayulu was predicted to be ruling party candidate Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari, according to a recent opinion poll. Fayulu said he was confident of victory. Can you, in all good faith, with what you've seen today, someone serious, can say that Shadari won the election or the presidential election? If he wants to dream, let him dream. Critics of longtime President Joseph Kabila, who has stayed in office two years beyond the end of his term, claim the chaos was intentional. Numerous analysts doubt the election was fair. Because the way these elections were organized and the way they happened, it seems to me that uh, it was a planned chaos. It simply, uh, and that does not uh, augur well for him as uh, it, he leaves power. Uh, and I think uh, he, will, he is going to look back and, uh, and uh, see the mess he has left behind. And I think he will live with that for many, many years to come. While counting started late Sunday in what is hoped to be the DRC's first peaceful transition of power, this saga is likely to continue. The same poll that predicted an opposition victory also warned that the majority of Congolese voters would refuse to accept a ruling party win. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. Now, locals in Kinshasa on Monday are calling on electoral officials to reveal the results of Sunday's presidential election. The country's opposition says it, is, it expected one of its candidates to win the presidency based on early vote tallies. But the ruling coalition says it is very confident its candidate has won the race. For the latest from the DRC, viewers Abdurrahman Dia joins me by phone from Kinshasa. Abdurrahman, good evening. Good evening. Uh... Good evening to all. Now it looks uh, like it's uh, been uh, very, very chaotic in the DRC. What is the Electoral Commission saying about the conduct of the election? And so up to this point, uh, perhaps uh, what is the direction that it's looking that, uh, like it's going? Today they, they haven't been saying much. Uh, yesterday they talked to local media mainly by phone saying that uh, uh, they were pleased what, by what they were seeing. Um, basically minimizing the, the issues, the logistical and technical issues with the voting machine. Um, so, but today they haven't said anything so far. They just said that um, they will be starting to give uh, results in a few days without uh, much uh, detail. Now, it looks like uh, both sides are claiming victory already, yet there are no provisional results. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, does it, uh, in some respects, indicate that they are accepting the process, but they expect to win? Well, they, I think it's a war of war there that we are having. It's mainly uh, both camps saying that they are confident. Um, today, the spoke, one of the spokespersons of uh, 
uh, Shadori's uh, campaign, uh, Kikaya Bin Karubi, has read a statement to the press saying that they were very confident based on the results that uh, they are getting. Uh, but he fell short of declaring victory, saying that uh, Ramazani Shadari had signed the SADC Code of Conduct, which uh, pre prevents uh, candidates from giving the results. Uh, however, Martin Fayulu and Felix Tshisekedi did not sign that document last week uh, because they wanted the Electoral Commission to be part of it as well. Uh, so, uh, but uh, last night, uh, Martin Fayulu. Uh, said he was confident as well, but he did denounce all of the irregularities, um, the malfunctions, uh, and uh, some batteries not working on the machine. So basically, uh, what the um, the church observers were saying as well, uh, they noticed uh, a lot of issues um, on the ground. Now we know that is a huge country, and some of the problems were anticipated. Uh, are they, from the observation, have been there? Uh, those problems enough to make this uh, election uh, not credible or are they just uh, isolated incidents that can be in some ways uh, ignored for the sake of the bigger good the larger good of the country um, scientifically I'm not able to say how that could Im uh, impact the overall election but I did see a difference depending uh, on where you are in in Kinshasa, for example, in Gombe, which is some think could be a stronghold of the presidential majority. Uh, it was basically flawless. Uh, you know, uh, voting starting on started on time. The voting machine seemed to be working. I had I haven't seen any issues. But when you go to Limete, for example, which is a Chisekedi stronghold. And, uh, people were waiting some in some areas until up to three o'clock before even seeing the machine. Uh, so it was very chaotic in that area. Also in Jili, it was hard for many people to find their names. Um, so it is, it was there. You could see the difference between, uh, you know, how it went in Gombe and how how difficult and chaotic it was in other part of wow. uh, parts of Kinshasa. And I wonder people say they have suspicions about uh, uh, some of those malfunctioning machines. Abdurrahman, I want to thank you very much uh, for your reporting. Uh, that's our viewers, Abdurrahman, dear, reporting from Kinshasa in the DRC. Now, as we await the official final results of the DRC's presidential election, we thought now would be a good time to focus on the ordinary people of that country. Today we are continuing our series, We Are Congolese, about people sharing their hopes for their homeland. Let's meet um, Pesa Bangala Kobis. Déjà, étymologiquement, je pense que c'est certain, être congolais, c'est avoir un père et une mère de nationalité congolaise. Mais à mon avis, je pense encore, s'il faut bien être plus profond, je dirais, être congolais, c'est être ces citoyens qui, qui vivent dans un sol vachement riche, mais au finalité, c'est celui qui est le plus malheureux au monde. C'est ça, être un congolais. Le problème se pose au, au niveau de la classe politique. Hein? C'est tellement simple, c'est pas une question des individus, c'est un problème du système. Il faudrait juste changer le système en place, c'est la moindre des choses. On peut bien beau changer des individus, euh, ce ne sont pas le, le, les êtres humains, les personnes physiques qui créent ces, ces, cette situation déplorable. C'est la philosophie tout entière. J'aimerais que chaque Congolais puisse faire euh, euh, le retour vers ses racines euh, d'abord spirituel. Euh, C'est bien bon, sommes-nous tous chrétiens, musulmans, j'en passe, mais nous avons perdu cette euh, connexion spirituelle avec euh, nos aïeux, nos ancêtres. Cela devait être notre premier pas vers l'émergence. Une fois on aura lié des liens solides avec le monde spirituel africain authentique que nous avons, Je pense par après on pourrait passer à l'étape politique, sociale et tout sera mieux. Non, certainement, non, je ne pourrai jamais. Car dis donc, je me rappelle encore que euh, Aristote a dit, un grand philosophe aussi, que la violence est l'arme de faible. Hein, plutôt le sage utilise euh, le mot 
cela est plus fort que la violence. Donc la violence n'est pas mon plat préféré. J'utilise beaucoup plus de paroles et de mots doux. Euh, tout d'abord, je suis un optimiste. Je pense que dans une année, si les élections s'étaient, donc euh, on aura un nouveau gouvernement. Et sur leur mandat de 5 ans, il en est suffisamment beaucoup pour essayer d'harmoniser et de structurer euh, l'autorité de l'État. Donc euh, dans cette optique, je pense que dans une année. Well, sadly, rape has always been a weapon of war. But in the Democratic Republic of Congo, widespread sexual violence continues and child recruitment continues many years after the country's war ended. Africa 54's Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick has more. Haiti. Hello there, Vincent. The DRC is often referred to as the capital of rape. Multiple conflicts across the eastern parts of the country have trapped communities in a web of violence, creating child soldiers and a hotbed of sexual violence against women and children. I traveled to New York recently and spoke to one of the women trying to change that. These Congolese women have horrific experiences in common. They are survivors of sexual violence. It's a grim reality in the DRC's most dangerous regions. Children are forced to join armed rebel groups for a life of servitude and abuse. UNICEF reports that more than 3,000 children, boys and girls, in the Democratic Republic of Congo were recruited by militia over the past year. I wanted to know why this is such a problem in that country. At UN headquarters in New York, I meet the woman leading the fight against sexual violence and child soldier recruitment in the DRC. Janine Mabunda was appointed in 2014. It's her job to help bring perpetrators to justice, a task as complicated as the country itself. The soldier child issue came from the decade of conflict that uh, Congo has suffered. Instead of denying the fact, we have decided to address this fact. We have so far in the last decade separated almost 46,000 soldier child from uh, former militia. We took our responsibility and we say uh, we will not blame the other people. We will take that as part of our history, but we will fight against it in such a manner that we learn for the future. A future haunted by past conflict that has claimed tens of thousands of lives over two decades, especially in the country's eastern region, where women have long been targets for rape by soldiers, by rebels, even by UN peacekeepers. Do you feel like your country has failed its women? Sometimes we are a little bit unfair about the uh, sea situation. Here is a country with the size of European Union, with 80 million people. When you are in the head town Kinshasa and that you have addressed an issue of conflict in Eastern Congo, it's like if you are in London and you have to address a logistical issue, a human issue in Moscow with less facility in terms of communication, transportation than you have in this both country. Mabunda points to prosecutions in recent years that ended in imprisonment of army commanders, soldiers, militiamen and a politician for crimes involving sexual violence. We want to set it clear from top to bottom, from bottom to top, that Congo and its leader and its population do not accept anymore uh, rape on woman, and we do not uh, find it normal. It's not acceptable. Mabunda believes changing reality for women inside her country can help change perceptions about them outside the DRC. I want to be the voice of the woman of Congo who says that we are a little bit tired of being long depicted as the capital of rape. They are not the one to create the conflict. They are not the one to maintain the tension around past conflict, but they are the ones suffering from the conflict. We can fight, but if we don't find good willing men to accompany us in the fight, then it will not work. Well, now, Congolese authorities have carried out an increasing number of prosecutions for rape in recent years. But as you can imagine, even as they work to bring those perpetrators to justice, the vast majority have gone unpunished. Vincent? It is a sad, sad situation. Thanks a lot, Haiti.
for that report. Now, in Southern Africa, former Mozambican Finance Minister Manuel Chang is under arrest on charges of committing financial crimes after being detained over the weekend at Oliver Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg. The Mozambican embassy in South Africa confirmed Chang's detention to the independent television station STV. Chang was arrested in response to an international warrant issued by U.S. authorities. The warrant from a Pretoria magistrate says Chang specifically faces charges of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, conspiracy to commit securities fraud, and money laundering. Chang was finance minister during the 10-year tenure of Amando Kebuza, who was president between 2005 and 2015. Now, whether it was their accomplishments on earth or in outer space, some notable people died in 2018, from singers to fashion designers to a former president. Viewers Maria Madialo tells us more. Singer Smokey Robinson paid an emotional tribute to his childhood friend Aretha Franklin, who died this year following a long battle with pancreatic cancer. Franklin was a recipient of 18 Grammy Awards and sold more than 75 million records. Loved ones, celebrities, and political leaders, including former U.S. President Bill Clinton, were among the thousands to honor her. She lived with courage, not without fear, but overcoming her fears. Movie fans said goodbye to 1970s sex symbol Burt Reynolds and comic fans to Marvel comic magnate Stan Lee, who died at the age of 95. That's for you, Stan Lee. That's for you, baby. You always will live in this heart forever. The world also lost British physicist and author Stephen Hawking. He died at 76 in his home in Cambridge. Stephen Hawking was a huge personality worldwide. He had this amazing ability to connect with people. The fashion industry bid farewell to American and French designers Kate Spade and Hubert de Givenchy. A homage for Givenchy showcased dresses inspired by the creator's most iconic designs worn by stars like Audrey Hepburn and Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Spade took her own life. TV evangelist Billy Graham also died this year at the age of 99. Graham, who preached to millions around the world, was considered one of the leading spiritual voices of the 20th century. I want to ask you tonight, do you love God? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your soul? In South Africa, thousands of mourners packed a 40,000-seat stadium to celebrate the powerful anti-apartheid icon, Winnie Mandela, who died at the age of 81. Africa lost another of its beloved figures, former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. A Nobel Peace Prize winner, Annan was hailed as a guiding force for good. Astronaut Alan Bean, who walked on the moon, died at the age of 86. Bean traveled to the moon almost 50 years ago as a member of the Apollo 12 mission. Well, it was like you won the lottery, only even better. And a member of an American political dynasty died in 2018. Family and friends, including four former U.S. presidents and President Donald Trump, packed into the Washington National Cathedral's prayer hall to mourn U.S.'s 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush. A great and noble man, the best father a son or daughter could have. And in our grief, let us smile knowing that Dad is hugging Robin and holding Mom's hand again. The late Bush was laid to rest in Texas next to his wife, who also died this year, and their daughter Robin, who died of leukemia at the age of three. Maria Madialo, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Still ahead on Africa 54, how digital developments are helping and hurting developing nations. But first, a look at Monday's headlines.
digital developments uh, that have appended businesses throughout the global economy, from music to manufacturing, are also changing what the world trades and how manufacturers and merchants move and sell their goods. Experts tell viewers Jim Randall, uh, the digital revolution presents significant opportunities, but also serious problems for countries. Global trade is helped by digital advances like artificial intelligence, e-commerce, and machine translation. They cut costs, and that's generally helpful to exporters in smaller nations and newer, less well-financed companies, according to economists. These massive computer servers, linked together in many nations, securely track transactions and data in a digital system called blockchain. These blockchains enable new exporters and distant lands to reassure potential customers that a new company can produce goods as promised, according to World Trade Organization chief Roberto Azevedo. Everybody knows what or who Volkswagen is, or Toyota, or IBM, but nobody knows who is a small company. Is that a legitimate business? Are they in the market for quite some time? Are they legit? Uh, those questions blockchains would answer. Another digital development, 3D printing, may eventually mean that some factories are replaced by devices that print physical objects instead of just words on paper. More 3D printing could cut low-skill, low-paying jobs in developing economies, according to Brookings Institution trade and technology expert Joshua Meltzer. It would then um, further undermine, I think, uh, the comparative advantages that developing countries still have in low-cost labour. Rural areas and developing nations have the lowest level of Internet access. Only about half the world's population can currently get online. Meltzer says full access to broadband and mobile devices are needed to make serious progress. Essentially, Internet plans that are affordable is going to be part of a package of measures that's just going to be needed to build the absolute foundations for any of this to matter. Manufacturing was a key to the rise of advanced economies. But economic activity in developed nations has shifted from making things to managing ideas and information in the services economy. Advanced economies have an advantage over developing countries because they have more highly educated workers with specialized skills needed for service industries. An expert in trade and economics says the shift to a services economy could make it harder for developing nations to catch up. So you've already seen the start, I think. I think the digital revolution will really ad advance that in the, to, to a, a great degree. Claude Barfield of the American Enterprise Institute also says politics could complicate economic issues as leaders of developing nations may be torn between allowing new digital companies the freedom they need to expand and boost economic growth and the temptation to use digital technology for social control and political purposes. Jim Randall, VOA News, Washington. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. 2018 was a hot year in entertainment on the continent. Ethiopia has hosted the second edition of the African Circus Arts Festival. 11 circus troupe artists from six African countries performed at the event, which entertained Addis Ababa's uh, residents with a variety of acrobats, hoopers, jugglers, and contortionists. Dakar Fashion Week in Senegal, one of the continent's oldest fashion exhibitions, revealed stunning looks by designers from across Africa in June. Organizers say they hoped the event would give a place to promote and give exposure to African designers. South Africa celebrated graffiti in October. Artists in a rundown area of Johannesburg picked up their cans as part of the City of Gold Festival. The goal is reimagining downtown Johannesburg as a city that overflows with art. Well, next up, um, medical researchers in the U.S. and Portugal are developing what is effectively an electronic tattoo. And they say it could have uses in everything from treating diseases to monitoring health, operating prosthetic or stimulating flesh and blood body parts. It's applied to the skin or under your skin, similar to a temporary tattoo, and is controlled through a Bluetooth connection. The key component, this silver alloy that is printed very similarly to how a regular ink, inkjet 
printer works. That, they say, makes it cheaper and easier to produce than similar projects. They are calling it e-skin. Well, and finally, a Belgian a Belgium company is hoping their eco-friendly lampshades made out of mushrooms will shine a light on a greener alternative economy. And Palmer Fungi is a social economy enterprise that produces organic oyster mushrooms and chicory from coffee ground waste. Uh, the leftovers of this organic production have been recycled and the main ingredient for the mushroom-based material which creates these innovative lampshades. And the designer says the mushroom-based material the lamps are made of has a very versatile nature. It can also be turned into flower pots, be used for packaging, acoustic insulation, and even replace construction bricks. And that's what is trending today. While the crystal-covered ball at Times Square in New York City is ready for the traditional drop marking the countdown to the new year. At this New Year's Eve event, the uh, president of uh, Sino-American Friendship Association will press the launch button as a guest for the first time. The ball highlights a different theme each year. And the theme this year is Gift of Harmony, implying the hope for a harmonious world. Chinese characters of a Chongqing, China, are in the launch button as a, Ch a Chongqing municipality in southwest China will give a performance of New Year's Eve. As the biggest crystal ball in the world, the Times Square ball weighs nearly six tons and has over 32,000 LED lights, which will create 16 million colors and billions of patterns. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, just be sure to watch Africa 50 on our website at viewafrica.com. And for more news, tune in to VA's evening radio show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the morning today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night and we wish you all the best in the new year.